Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, why corporate welfare needs to end, a dangerous proposal to regulate internet news, and why the litmus test on bilingual politicians needs to go away. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Yes, indeed. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends, as that old Emerson, Lake, and Palmer song goes. Good to have you aboard on Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. Thanks very much for tuning in. The interesting thing about Canadian politics is that it tends to go sometimes glacially slow and other times at such paces you can't keep up with it. It's like feast or famine. And we've actually been very fortunate uh, given that we're in an election year last year and that seems to have carried into 2020 so far that there's a lot going on and a lot to chew on. Not that political news is necessarily good for the country, but it's good for talk radio. So uh, when the country's doing well, I'm happy as a Canadian. When the country's in rough shape, I'm happy as a broadcaster. So it's like that old saying that I've kind of coined, which is there are no bad experiences. There's good experience and there's material. So we're in the material column right now (laughs) in some respects. We're going to talk later on in the show about this bilingualism litmus test that the media seems to be injecting into Canadian politics politics, and even into the Canadian Conservative Party's leadership race, which normally has been relatively insulated from this whole Franco supremacy thing that we see going on. So we'll talk about that later on in the program. I also want to give a little bit of a toast to Nigel Farage and the Brexiteers who are going to be successful. Britain is leaving the European Union at long last, and it will be This will be the last episode of the show that is recorded while the UK is in the EU. So we have to talk about that and acknowledge a great farewell speech that was done and some other things that are going on in the show today that we'll get to as well. I try not to, at the beginning of the show, tell you too much about what's happening because sometimes I change my mind mid-middle of the show or... I mean, sometimes I change my mind mid-sentence with where we're going. So those little previews about what's coming up Little known fact, I record those at the end once I know what I've talked about. I shouldn't have told you that. No, you you never want to know how the sausage is made. So disregard that. It's like a jury. You have to just pretend you never heard that and and move on with your life. I do want to start off, though, if you are a credit card user, uh, you are not getting any benefit, even though the company that you may well use for your credit card got a huge $49 million check from the government. This, This is absolutely insane. MasterCard one of the two biggest credit card companies in the world, gets $49 million from Justin Trudeau's government to form this intelligence and cyber center, which is going to be $510 million that it costs, and of that, almost 10% coming from the federal government. The center's goal, according to an article in the Vancouver Sun, or a Canadian press article, actually, to ensure that any internet-enabled device ranging from phones and tablets to computers and vehicles can be used without fear that personal or financial information could be stolen. The center will support about 380 jobs and 100 co-op positions. Now, I don't know if they mean like high school co-op students or paid co-op students, but 380 jobs, which works out to be, I think it's like 140 or 150,000 per job if you take the total sum of money that the government is putting into this. But the thing that I find baffling is that on one hand, we're saying this is for cybersecurity. And on the other hand, when Justin Trudeau was asked about this by Andrew Scheer and also by Jagmeet Singh a lot in the House of Commons, his answer was non-existent. I mean, there, there was nothing that he said to indicate what actually was going on and what this money was actually for. And I, I want you to hear this clip. And let me know if you have any more of an idea than I do about what it is that Trudeau was actually doing here. MasterCard is a credit card company that makes money off of people who can't afford to pay their full balances. Why did the Prime Minister think that they needed a handout? You're right, Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, we continue to invest in things that are going to create jobs for Canadians and support hard-working families right across the country. We recognize uh, that investing in different sectors of the economy uh, allows us to move forward in a positive way for Canadians. Everything this government does is focused on growing the middle class and helping people working hard to join it, like the tax cut we're moving forward with that is putting uh, more Absolutely. money in the pockets of 20 million Canadians and lifting Absolutely. close to a million people off of the federal tax roll. These are the kinds of things that make a difference in people's lives. To give this profitable company $50 million of public money. While they drag their feet to deliver the health care that Canadians need so they can, they can afford the medication, why does the Liberal government keep giving money to profitable companies instead of investing in our health care? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, the NDP is choosing to share uh, this uh, erroneous perception uh, that uh, we have uh, not taken real action on moving forward on reducing the cost of prescription drugs for Canadians. We've moved forward in significant ways that have lowered the costs for prescription drugs for Canadians. We've continued to move forward on creating a national drug agency, on moving forward on the strategy for uh, high-cost uh, rare disease medications. We we know there is much more to do. We will continue to work with them and everyone in this house to deliver on affordable health care for all Canadians. What? I. What? So somehow it ends up becoming about health care and pharma care. And I realize part of that is how NDP leader Jagmeet Singh asked the question. But the original question that Andrew Scheer put forward, a very valuable one, we're talking about a company that posted, I think it was $60 billion or $16 billion in profits. I want to verify that because I had it up on my screen here a moment ago. I think it was $16 billion in revenue last year, not profits, revenue. And we're still talking about a multi-billion dollar company and a profitable company and one that in many cases is recession proof in some respects. Now, in, in other areas, you look at consumer behavior. If you don't have much money, you don't have much cash flow, you're more reliant on credit card. So Visa and MasterCard have solid business models. They tend to do very well over time. And they're getting a bailout, essentially, of $49 million to do something that it sounds like would be a selling point for their business. If MasterCard's saying, hey, we've got this state-of-the-art center that is going to protect your information, protect you, protect all that you're doing, that seems like a really good feature that is going to pay off over time. If it is just about protecting consumer uh, interests and protecting consumer data, then all companies would have these things. The government would be giving money to Visa to do it, to Amex, to all of the banks. No, it's to MasterCard only. And when asked about it, Trudeau doesn't mention cybersecurity. Trudeau doesn't mention all about the Internet of Things and the immersive economy and data and all this stuff. He says, oh, well, we're always going to invest in things that are going to create jobs. I mean, the problem with corporate welfare is that it never actually creates jobs. It's like that age-old expression, if you teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. If you give him a fish, he just eats for that one day. And I know I reversed it there, but the sentiment is still true. If you give a bailout or a check or a corporate welfare payment of some kind for jobs, those jobs are only going to exist as long as that government check is there because it is not a sustainable job unless the business model of the company says it's sustainable. And you look at Bombardier as a fantastic example of this, a, a company that can't stand on its own two feet unless someone is holding it up from behind, pulling it from above, and holding at the sides just to make sure. This is a company that only exists to be a receptacle of corporate welfare. And the problem with this is that when you're in a recession, government says, well, the economy's bad, we've got to protect uh, and promote and preserve, so we've got to put all of this money towards companies. And when we're in a relatively good economy, and a lot of that is because, because of the United States, but we're in a relatively good economy, then the government says, well, things are going well, we can afford it, we can afford to invest. So I'm sitting here as a taxpayer going, wait, well, if the time to invest is when things are bad, and the time to invest is when things are good, and when things are in between, you invest because you don't want them to get bad. When is the time to not spend money on this? When is the point that, okay, well, I guess we don't need corporate welfare anymore? 
And it, it's not just MasterCard, it's not just Bombardier, Loblaw, a great example, which just a few weeks ago announced job losses, despite getting millions from the federal government, I think last year, it might have been two years ago, but I, I'm pretty sure it was last year. I mean, so when Maxime Bernier comes out and says, we're going to end corporate welfare, everyone said, oh, well, that's terrible. That's You can't do that. Why? What on earth does Canada get out of corporate welfare? Corporate welfare is what leads to companies like SNC Lavalin staying on board and online and getting government contracts. Corporate welfare is the mentality that keeps Bombardier on life support. And corporate welfare is even rewarding profitable, I'd say successful companies for what purpose? For what purpose? How are Canadians benefiting from this money going to MasterCard? And interestingly enough, I was reading in one article a comment that said this is actually going to be about cybersecurity for the entire world. So this little center in Vancouver is going to be part of MasterCard's global operation. And I know Canada is going to get the employment out of it, but then I'm like, well, wait, why is customer satisfaction for MasterCard customers in Britain or India or Japan or the, or the United States. Why is that now the responsibility of Canada? And th this whole thing is absolutely senseless, but this is where we're going. And now Justin Trudeau's got a friend for life from MasterCard. He's got a friend for life from the people that are going to be working at the center in Vancouver. And the whole point is, if the economy is doing well, these companies clearly can afford to staff their own centers and they can afford to do their own projects. Because the other side of corporate welfare is that government is picking and choosing winners. Why not Visa? Why not Amex? Why not TD? Why not Scotia? And, and the reason is once you start doing that, you can't afford it. You can't afford to pay everyone off. So you just pick and choose which ones do. And then these companies have a competitive advantage over all of the other ones. You let the market work this stuff out. And that's why I absolutely love Rick Peterson's idea, which is the conservative leadership candidate who is rehashing the tax plan that he had in 2017 in the leadership race, which is to say a 15% personal flat tax for personal income tax and an abolition, a complete abolishment of the corporate income tax rate. And doing this is going to let individuals better manage their finances and also take a lot of the burdens off of companies, particularly small and medium-sized companies, so that they can better be equipped to deal with the market and, and deal with the market realities. And the way you support companies, real corporate welfare, is by allowing a climate that can let them invest. Because the problem is that there is inevitably going to be a race to the bottom. And you see this with production, with film productions. There are more and more, if you watch the credits of movies, which I do because I have no life, the more and more films you see at the end are produced in partnership with the state of Georgia, produced in partnership with the state of Oklahoma even, produced in partnership with these, and ones that are filmed in Canada. The list goes on of, oh, the Telefilm Grant and uh, ACTRA and the, uh, you know, C Quebec Film Board and the Canadian Film Board and the National, like, it, uh, it, you see this and the list goes on and on of all of these organizations that contributed in some way to buying that production going there. And remember, when Amazon was looking around for its HQ2 that uh, everyone was asking about, this was like pathetic the way that cities, provinces were bending over backwards to say, how much can we give Amazon? We're just going to make it rain to buy them to come here. And I, I don't fault the companies for this because the companies are doing what any company is. If, 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 if someone were to come to me and said, Andrew, I'm going to give you uh, this for this thing you're already going to do anyway, I'm going to pay for 20% of it. I'd be, all right, just sign me up, hand over the check. Where is it? The responsibility is for government to say no and to say, listen, I mean, we can promise you we'll stay out of your way. We won't regulate you out of existence. We won't tax you out of existence, but we're not going to get into this race to the bottom of buying you to come here because that's what these companies are doing now. They're leveraging their own existence and it's 
forcing corporate welfare to be ramped up, which is why you have to stop it all. You can't just pick and choose. You have to say, no, this is not something that we are going to rely on as being a tool to somehow grow the economy because it just isn't going to work that way. And that, by the way, when Trudeau says in that little response there, what was supposedly to pass for a response about the importance of, you know, growing the middle class and those seeking to join it, we still don't have a definition for it. So this Minister for Middle Class Prosperity, Mona Fortier, has been on the job now for how long? Three, three months, pushing three months, and still cannot identify it. And this was, I think, absolutely laughable because the middle class is this malleable term, but Trudeau speaks of it like it's gospel. He says, oh, you know, the middle class and those seeking to join it. Okay, seeking to join it. What's that target? What's that benchmark? How do I know when I've made it there? How do I know when I've joined the middle class? And the answer to that, according to Trudeau and according to uh, Minister Fortier, Quote, the income required to attain a middle-class lifestyle can vary greatly based on Canadians' specific situation. Canada has no statistical measure, no official statistical measure of what constitutes the middle class. The trick in this is that everyone thinks they're middle class because no one, no one views themselves as being particularly wealthy. I mean, you've got the super rich, obviously, but most people, even those who are very affluent are going to say, yeah, you know, I'm middle class. And we subcategorize under there, upper, upper middle class, middle middle class, lower middle class. But the government is basically mandating this group that it has no interest in defining, which is great because this is what they do with assault weapons and all of these other things. They just pick a word and expect that everyone knows what it means when it's actually nothing to do with what the government is saying it's to do with. But it's laughable to me that so many people are prepared to go along with this. You as might as well have the Ministry of Feel Goods, the Ministry of Platitudes, the Ministry of whatever. Silly Walks was the old Monty Python one, because this is what we're dealing with here. It's a ministry that is completely non-existent for a portion of the population that is not defined. Imagine, for example, there was a Minister of Poverty and they were asked, okay, well, what's what's poverty? What's poverty? And they said, well, you know, it's you, you, you've got to be uh, open to, you know, different things. And, you know, re re poverty looks different in Toronto than it does in uh, Hamilton, than it does in Owen Sound, than it does in Burnaby. And, uh, you know, poverty, uh, you know, you, you know if you're impoverished. Like, well, okay, maybe you do. But if you're talking about a national strategy to address it, you'd think or hope that maybe there is a number in mind or a metric in mind. And it's not just that they haven't figured it out yet. It's that this minister doesn't seem to think it's relevant to even have one because she's now had several months, but MP Pat Kelly asks her in the House of Commons, okay, what is it? And she's like, yeah, there's, there's no measure. Then what's the point? How do we know? If we've succeeded in achieving that Trudopian dream of joining the middle class, if we don't have a measure to know we've got there. More of The Andrew Lawton Show in just a moment. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Hey, welcome back. So I don't really trust government to do all that much, and I don't think I'm alone in this. So color me a little bit skeptical of these proposals that appear in a report that was just tabled before government the other day, in fact, a report chaired by Janet Yale, who was the head of the Broadcasting and Telecommunications Legislative Review Panel. She pushed her report to government, and this report deals with a number of issues from whether to tax Netflix to how to make streaming services provide Canadian content, whether CBC is permitted or should be permitted to have advertising or should be entirely reliant on uh, subsidies. And the final report called Canada's Communications Future, Time to Act, lists a number of recommendations that among other things, would just completely disrupt the way telecommunications and in traditional media operate now in some ways, and in other ways I think are just absolute tax grabs. But there are a couple of very concerning ones in here. As I, as I look through the list, and I mean, how many recommendations are there? I think there are 97. 
97 recommendations, but I want to read two in particular that have stood out, and I might do more in the future as I work my way through this. But the two in particular, number 73 and 74, we recommend that to promote the discoverability of Canadian news content, the CRTC impose the following requirements as appropriate on media aggregation and media sharing undertakings. Links to the websites of Canadian sources of accurate, trusted, and reliable sources of news with a view to ensuring a diversity of voices and prominence rules to ensure visibility and access to such sources of news. And number 74, we recommend that the Broadcasting Act be amended to ensure that the CRTC can, by regulation, condition of license, or condition of registration, impose codes of conduct, including provisions with respect to resolution mechanisms, transparency, privacy, and accessibility regarding all media content undertakings. Now, the reason this is so important is because we're talking about the imposition of codes of conduct and also a government definition of what a reliable and fair news organization is. And the only way it can do this is by a centralized registry of online media. And this is something I've been sounding the alarm about for quite some time because it was only a matter of time before it got to this point. As the government takes its crusade against fake news and all of these other things, they use as terms of convenience. And Blacklock's reporter, which has just been doing some phenomenal work as of late, had picked up on this as well. And they noted that the report calls for internet news media to register with the government and ultimately do this so that they would be subject to federal codes of conduct. Now, the chair of the panel says we are not proposing to regulate the internet and we are not proposing to regulate news online. Nevertheless, the panel's report calls what we have right now in Canada a crisis in news. They say it's about helping production of content and all of these other things. Here's the problem. The CRTC does not have jurisdiction over the content of online news. The CRTZ has content restrictions on what goes on conventional broadcast. The CBSA has some other controls, and I know that's technically industry-led, but still, it, it has essentially the force of law behind it. So when you start broadening who's included in this to online media, how can there not be an issue of what we're seeing now, which is the liberals wanting to pick and choose who can access their events, who can cover things, extending to government. And this is so dangerous for Canada, so dangerous that we even have the inch of support or ounce of support, I guess is more accurate, for a registry of government-approved news. Because this is what was happening when the bailout list was put together. All of a sudden, there's a, a right answer and a wrong answer to what are you doing as an organization? And the government has used this now as the basis to say, all right, well, you're government-approved media. And you may remember back in the federal election, I was jumping around trying to cover the campaign, and the liberals were saying, oh, you're not accredited media. You don't have accreditation. And as you've heard me say in the past, there is no centralized accreditation database in Canada, nor should there be. Countries like the UK have press cards, other countries have press licenses, but in Canada that does not exist, and it shouldn't exist because in a freedom-loving country, a country with free press, there's no gatekeeper to who can be a journalist. You are a journalist or you're not. It's a craft. It's not a licensed profession. And when you start talking about state registries and the idea that there has to be a list of government-approved media, it's impossible to not have that go down the road of government picking and choosing who's legitimate based on subjective measures. And th they will be subjective. There's no way they won't be because... In a lot of cases, this idea of fake news is in this column of I know it when I see it. And what the government likes to call fake news is opinion it disagrees with. And if you say, all right, well, there's the line right there. No opinion is allowed. Well, CBC has opinion. Toronto Star has opinion. National Post has opinion. Legitimate media incorporates opinion. So all of these platforms, of which True North is one, by the way, risk the government saying, no, 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 you're not officially 
You're not officially media on the list. And once you're off that list, it's not just about whether you get the tax credit or the bailout money, which True North doesn't get and isn't interested in, but it goes beyond that. You lose access because now the government has a tool to deny you access to government events. They say, oh, well, the, the CRTC has reviewed and, and you don't fall into this list. So it basically is trying to silence new media and protect the stronghold that traditional media used to have, and I think in some ways thinks they have, on the media sector and on the media industry. So Ms. Yale can say, all right, well, we're not trying to regulate online news. Well, what is this code of conduct? What is the code of conduct? What is the code of conduct going to be that by this report's own definition will be imposed on those who register with the CRTC, on these online content providers that are going to be trying to play ball with this because they feel they have to, because that's the only way they'll be able to survive as organizations. And when you read the report, it doesn't actually give you all that much clarity as far as what that means and what that would look like. Now, the good news is this isn't a law. This isn't a bill. The government has to pick this up and decide if it's worth legislating anything further on it. I'm going through some of the other recommendations right now. And, and like I said at the beginning of this, there is going to be a, a fair bit of material there that I can work through at other points in the show in the future. And uh, certainly I'll take a look and see if things are, are being addressed or ignored. And, and if I have something to add, I will. But, but I do want to read one additional paragraph here that I think is important. If I can pull it up here, it's that to further promote regulatory efficiency and flexibility, the CRTC should have the power to provide partial or additional relief to issue conditional and interim decisions and to issue ex parte decisions where it considers that the circumstances of the case justifies it. Now, the problem with this is that you're dealing with a regulatory framework that would allow CRTC to start clapping or clamping down on these new media operations that are supposed to be included in the now broadened list of content providers. So these codes of conduct, I mean, some of them that they talk about are, you know, how advertising to children works, but others are, and I want to read this section, could apply to different undertakings depending on the level of editorial control they exercise. So codes of conduct could extend to editorial content on new media. And that is absolutely the death knell for free speech in Canada if the government is now regulating the internet speech, not just by saying who's official and who's not, but even by having the mandatory capability of enforcing adherence to an editorial code of conduct. And I'm sorry, but there is no way in hell I would ever agree to play by their rules. There isn't. This is not an organization that has jurisdiction, and if government gives it jurisdiction, everyone better stand up and say no. And this is, by the way, just to segue into a clip I wanted to play for you, what the UK has done with Brexit. I said at the top of the show, the last day, the last show that is recorded while the UK is in the EU. And because of this, I have to share a little bit of this speech that Nigel Farage gave in the European Parliament, signaling his own exit, the last speech he'll give in the European Parliament. And it ended in such a glorious way as the chair of the Parliament basically proved the point of what the UK is leaving for. Take a watch. I want Brexit to start a debate across the rest of Europe. What do we want from Europe? If we want trade, friendship, cooperation, reciprocity, we don't need a European Commission. We don't need a European Court. We don't need these institutions and all of this power. And I can promise you, both in UKIP and indeed in the Brexit Party, we love Europe. We just hate the European Union. It's as simple as that. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping this begins the end of this project. It's a bad project. It isn't just undemocratic, it's anti-democratic, and it puts in that front row. It gives people power without accountability. People who cannot be held 
to account by the electorate. And that is an unacceptable structure. Indeed, there's an historic battle going on now across the West, in Europe, America and elsewhere. It is globalism against populism. And you may loathe populism, but I tell you a funny thing, it's becoming very popular. <laughs> and it has great benefits. No more financial contributions. No more European Court of Justice. No more common fisheries policy. No more being talked down to. No more being bullied. No more Guy Verhofstadt. I mean, I mean, what's not to like? I know you're going to miss us. I know you want to ban our national flags, but we're going to wave you goodbye. And we'll look forward in the future to working with you as sovereign... If you disobey the rules, you get cut off. Could we please remove the flags? <laughs> Mr. Farage, could we remove the flags, please? Well, that's it. It's all over. Finished. We're gone. Could I please ask for quiet? I'm really, please sit down, resume your seats, put your flags away, you're leaving, and take them with you if you are leaving now. And... <laughs> Goodbye. Isn't that just great? Leave and take your flags with you. I mean, the, the EU's entire existence is trying to deny countries their individuality. So it's unsurprising that they have a ban on national flags by the same stretch. But Nigel Farage and his caucus happily obliged. They left and they took their flags with them and they won't be coming back. So good for the UK for finally getting it. I know there are still some issues to be worked out. But again, this idea of figure it out later actually makes more sense than delay indefinitely will you try to come up with a deal when that lets the EU drag its heels. So thanks very much for indulging as I play that clip. I'm a big Nigel Farage fan. Back in a moment with the perils of official bilingualism here on The Andrew Lawton Show. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back. Bienvenue to le monde. The bilingualism litmus test is something that we have to talk about here because it's not a requirement to be the conservative leader. It's not a requirement to be the prime minister of Canada, but the media thinks it's not only necessary, but also is the most important trait required if you want to lead the country or lead a party. And I'm here to say, I don't think that's the case. Now, there are a couple of things at stake here. Peter McKay, when he announced his campaign, made a little bit of a flub in the words that he chose to use when he was announcing. Now, admittedly, it's kind of a, a boneheaded move to when you're announcing, and presumably you're reading from a script, not using the proper French terms. I think he used a three-word line, and of the three words, he got exactly three words wrong, which, <laughs> again, doesn't bode well, but it makes you mocked, but I... I it doesn't take away from the point here. And the, the words that he used, je sera candidate instead of je serai candidat. And well, that may sound similar if you don't speak French. It's if you were to say it in English, it would be like I am be candidate or I am be candida or something was what Stephen Marr of McLean's tried to compare it to. And it's not as amusing as JFK's infamous ode to the jelly donut, the ich bin ein Berliner uh, error in German. But it is certainly something that got McKay mocked. He was on the front page of uh, Le Journal de Quebec, Le Journal de Montréal, and they were saying in English on Le Journal de Quebec, good luck, mister, as if to say he has no hope in heck of winning because he didn't speak those three words of French properly. And I do think it's interesting why Peter McKay doesn't speak French better. I mean, he's had prime ministerial ambitions for quite some time. He's obviously been in politics. He, as a cabinet minister, had access to private French lessons. Since then, he could have learned. So if he hasn't, I wonder why, but at the same time, I also think that we put way too much stock in this. And, and I, I don't even want to say we, because I don't think Canadians do. The media puts way too much stock in this. And 
Aaron O'Toole, even the conservative leadership candidate, decided to spike the football on McKay. And Aaron O'Toole had tweeted out a link to this McLean's article called Why Doesn't Peter McKay Speak French? And uh, he had said uh, in it, uh, where was the, the exact thing? How can you represent Quebecers when you can't speak their language? And this was like the first attack of the conservative leadership race, I think. And I've thought about this a lot, and I think there is a benefit to speaking French. I think if you're running a national campaign and you know that you're going to be approached by French language media and you're going to want to talk to French voters and be in a French debate, there is an advantage to speaking French. But I don't think it's a requirement and I don't think it's a given. And by the way, this litmus test is not a long-standing one. It's relatively new. In 1993, Preston Manning did the French language debate, and he got up on stage, read a prepared statement, I believe in English. I, I can't remember. I think it was in English that he read it, but it was a prepared statement. Didn't participate in the debating part of the French debate because he couldn't understand what was being said and couldn't respond. And then he read a prepared closing statement. And that was that. And yeah, people in Quebec were upset. And then people said, oh, well, can he, can he actually participate? But who cares? He's a party leader. He doesn't speak French. Don't force it. There are other things you can bring to the table. And that's what I think is missing when everyone says that speaking French is the be all and end all. If you're from rural Alberta or BC or Saskatchewan or most of Manitoba and most of Ontario and most of Atlantic Canada, the only reason you have as a politician to speak French is to run for leader of your party, basically. I mean, there's a reason that in Ottawa, hey, so-and-so is learning French is kind of code for, hey, I think so-and-so is running for leader of their party. Because the, why else would you need that skill if you are representing a part of a country that doesn't have a French population, which is most of the country? Outside of Quebec and outside of New Brunswick, the only two provinces that have officially enshrined French, the French population is minuscule. And even Ontario, which has a, a Franco-Ontarian population and Manitoba, uh, the tiny, tiny percentages of the overall population of these provinces. We are a country that has French. We are not a French country. And I think a lot of this comes back to official bilingualism. And I want to talk about that in a moment with a representative of Canadians for Language Fairness, Gordon Miller. But I also think it's important that we understand that this is very much a media-driven narrative and not one that the Conservative Party of Canada needs to take too seriously. But there are people in the CPC that do take it seriously. I think a lot of that is because they just are backing a candidate who speaks French. So if they can say, oh, no, they, they got to speak French. You can't have someone who doesn't speak French. It's just because they're trying to draw people to, to whoever their candidate is, kind of like Aaron O'Toole was doing in that tweet. But I also think you need to look at the numbers. When Stephen Harper won a majority government in 2011, he had only five seats in Quebec. So a conservative majority even does not rely on Quebec votes. And Francophones outside of Quebec, I don't think are as obsessed with this need to speak French like Quebecers are. And obviously it's their language. I get it. But I wonder why we can't just have politicians that appoint lieutenants or lieutenants rather to deal with French issues. Why can you not just have a, a Francophone lieutenant in the same way that politicians will appoint someone to deal with the West, someone to deal with Quebec politics, someone to deal with any of these areas that require special attention? You know, the Prime Minister represents all Canadians, yes, but they don't have to be themselves the embodiment of all Canadians. You know, a prime minister has to represent liberals, conservatives, NDPers. That doesn't mean they need to be all of those things. They can't be. You can represent francophones without yourself speaking French just by surrounding yourself with a team of people that's going to help you do it the same way you would to represent all of these other Canadians, like those from the North, like those who are Indigenous. You don't have to be those things to represent those things. And yes, is it an asset to speak French? For sure. But if the time that someone could have put into speaking French, they put into volunteering or re learning about history or bettering themselves in some other way, why is that less virtuous than learning French? That's the question that no one's been prepared to answer. 
Want to talk to now from the board of directors of Canadians for Language Fairness, a group that fights against official bilingualism, Gordon Miller, who joins me on the line now. Gordon, thanks very much for coming on, sir. It's good to talk to you. Thank you. Very good to talk to you, Andrew. So let's start with the first question here of whether you think and your organization thinks that someone needs to speak English and French to represent all Canadians. Well, I I guess really our position isn't whether they need to. It's that uh, our concern is is that language always seems to trump merit. And and merit is is the principle of consideration for any major position in Canada. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care whether the prime minister is unilingual English or unilingual French, as long as that person stands for principles. And uh, and if we're talking about the current Conservative Party and their consideration that the leader has to be bilingual, uh, we just don't agree with that. Well, you raise an important... It's it's desirable, sure. Um, All other things equal, bilingualism is an asset. Well, but that's the point there, is that it is something that you can look at, I think, or should be able to look at as one of many qualities that someone could have. And it's like you're hiring for a job. You say, all right, well, you know, they have a master's degree, but they don't speak French, but they have 10 years of experience. And you decide at the end of it on balance which assets matter the most and and which bundle of assets and traits you might think is better than someone else's. The idea that we see the media putting forward now seems to be as though it's a deal breaker. And that idea of making it non-negotiable, I think, opens us up to, and I'm glad you brought up merit, a lot more issues down the line if you're prepared to ignore all of those other traits as long as this one is met. Right on, Andrew. Uh, In fact, if this country operated in the way that you just described, it would be a different country and a vastly more, um, uh, I would say, a prosperous and harmonious country. I know you're because, up there in Ottawa, and I used to live in Ottawa years ago, and, and I was working for government, so I didn't really leave the downtown that much. And I had this vision from just walking around those couple of square kilometers that it was a I mean, at least half English, half French city, but certainly one that felt as though the French population was a lot larger than it actually is if if you look at the broader city. And, And I do think that it's important to note here that official bilingualism has, it sounds like created this idea and this perception that there is a lot more of a presence of Franco Canadians than there actually is outside of Quebec anyway. Well, you get that impression, uh, and, and that, that's actually a legitimate impression because uh, Ottawa, I think it's somewhere around 13 or 14 percent. We have francophones, uh, but you do get the impression that it's much more when you're downtown. But a, a lot of that's because the federal government is, is uh, in Ottawa is about 70 percent francophones. It used to be 30, and now it's 70 how things have turned around. But, you know, all of those francophones are from Quebec and they're downtown in Ottawa. So you get the impression that the city is much more French than it really is. Now, is this something that we can link back to a a real market pivot point or has this been a a gradual rise? Because I I think that the issues that we were talking about at the beginning with the conservative leadership litmus test that we see presented and that stat you just mentioned about francophones in the public service, I think those two have to be related. Well, uh, actually, I'm kind of missing your point a wee bit, but uh, it's all very related. It all goes back to the Official Languages Act and the growth of uh, the francophones in in the public service is is strictly based on French and it's gotten to the point now uh, and unilingual or sort of marginally bilingual uh, Anglophones in the uh, federal government, they're they're afraid to even speak about it, but uh, there's there's a definite discrimination going on there. Uh, it, It can't be denied. And that's that's Ottawa. Yeah, but I guess the question that I was putting there is, has this been more gradual or was it just when that Official Languages Act was put into effect, it was as though a, a, fl- a switch was flipped and we've never gone back? 
Well, yes, a flip was, uh, <laughs> a switch was flipped, but uh, but yes, I mean it, it wasn't instantly going from thirty percent uh, francophones to seventy percent francophones. And quite honestly, I can't tell you um, what exactly the gradient was over the years. But uh, here's where we are today, and the federal public service is a francophone organization now, and. You know, when you get right down to it, um, the whole concept of bilingualism is fine and uh, official bilingualism. Well, actually, we really don't agree that there should be language laws, but we certainly do agree that the federal government, where it meets the public, should definitely be able to address the public in both languages. And I think, you know, if you look at the city of Ottawa, they do an excellent job in that regard in, in terms of being able to address both languages. In fact, I think we, we actually think that they go way over the top, but fine. At, at the public interface, that's where bilingualism should be. And, and in this country, uh, when I really, when you think about it, uh, you know, Anglophones who grow up in Quebec have an opportunity to be bilingual. Francophones who grow up in the rest of Canada have an opportunity to be bilingual. There's amazing opportunities for bilingual people where we need to have bilingualism. But the problem with official bilingualism, it's just over the top. And it really what it amounts to now is that you really have to be competent you know, highly competent in French. 85% of the Canadian population can't qualify for a, uh, any type of a supervisory or management job in government because they're just not sufficiently bilingual. Not only that, if you go all the way back to the Official Languages Act uh, and look at the percentage of the Canadian population, it was somewhere around 13, 14% or so uh, or, uh, was uh, capable of being bilingual. Uh, today, I think it's 16 or 17 percent. It's hardly changed. And that's with all of this money that's been thrown into all of these, uh, you know, French immersion schools across Canada. Uh, it, it's, it's just over the top. And, you know, when we start talking about expense, I mean, we don't even know how much it's cost for all of the training for bilingualism in the, in the federal government. And what's more is, that training doesn't work an awful lot of the time because they go on French training, but then they're still not sufficiently qualified to take those senior positions because you just can't learn a language because you go and take courses and that sort of thing. You need to be immersed in it. You have to live in it. And that's never going to happen in, in across this country. Well, and that right there is one of the big problems we see with conservative leadership candidates in the current context, but politicians more broadly, is that they're criticized for not speaking French. And even the ones that do go through the process of learning enough to get by are then criticized for not being good enough at French. And at a certain well, point, sure. it seems well, like they all they want all is for them Peter to be McKay born as regard. Francophones. <laughs> It seems like they just are never going to be happy unless it's a francophone that's in that position, a native-born francophone, and that isn't realistic. It's not practical, and it's not uh, where the country is if you want to limit the pool of, of talent to a, a group that is still a minority in Canada. Well, not only limit the pool to a minority, it, it happens to be a minority that comes out of Quebec. And if you look at what's happening in Ontario, they were trying to put through new... Uh, a couple of new acts that would make Ontario essentially officially bilingualism across the province. And uh, how do you fill all of the necessary jobs when everything has to be bilingual? Well, they're going to have to come to, from Quebec. So, I mean, it, it's almost like they're asking for an invasion. It, <laughs> yeah, it, it really... It's it's, it's uh, funny, though, because I, I was in Montreal for a, a project I was working on for my, uh, one of the other hats that I wear, and I had to navigate the bureaucracy. And I, I have a passable knowledge of French. I, I don't consider myself fluent or bilingual. And I was uh, dealing with the city of Montreal and, and at one point could not find someone who spoke English. Um, now, I don't have an expectation of that. I'm in Quebec. It's a French province. I get that. But it is interesting how there is a double standard there that what Quebec is able to do as far as not having Anglophones in uh, positions of service uh, would never be able to fly on the reverse, in the federal government anyway. Well, absolutely. Actually, uh, 
in Canadians for language fairness, uh, we actually believe that Quebec as a province has it right. Uh, they are a French culture with a French language, and they want to preserve it. That's great. We don't agree with language laws, but the point of the matter is Quebec's French, is, it, it always has been, and it probably always will be. Uh, unfortunately, the rest of Canada is English, um, always has been, uh, but will it be with the amount of money that's spent by the federal government on all of these linguistic activist groups that are trying to make the rest of the uh, country officially bilingual province by province? Well, fortunately, it'll never happen at West, but Ontario is in dangerous position. And if you look recently, um, the federal government, it, well, let's put it this way, um, uh, Education is a provincial responsibility under the British North America Act. Uh, in Ontario, uh, Doug Ford uh, said, we're not going to go ahead with this ridiculous expense in this French university in Toronto. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the federal government comes in with money and buys them off. Well, you know, that, that's a huge problem because, first of all, the gov federal government shouldn't be involved in education. And, and, and second of all, uh, Doug Ford essentially capitulated and said, okay, well, you know, <laughs> you'll go ahead with it now. Uh, not to mention with Bills 135 and 137 to make Ontario, you know, totally uh, francophone, bilingual, etc. Uh, he, he was basically silent on those things. Now, yes, they didn't pass the, you know, the, the second read for the second reading, but nevertheless, uh, he he was he was invisible, and we really need to start speaking up, because as far as I'm concerned, I I have complete respect for any francophone living in Ontario. Uh, I I think they should be able to be addressed in their language at the interface of the federal government. Uh, I would say though the Ontario government uh, in communities where numbers warrant by all means, but there's no way we should be bilingual across the province in that regard, because we just shouldn't be spending money on that. We're broke to begin with. Yeah, very well said. And we were talking about a bit, a bit about the budget early on. So, you know, you can have all these things on the wish list, but it uh, does mean you have the ability to pay for them. Gordon Miller from Canadians for Language Fairness joins me on the line now. Thanks very much for your time, Gord. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you for uh, discussing the issues. You know, that story in Montreal it was very true. I was trying to get a parking permit, and you, there was only one person in the city of Montreal, Bureau d'Access, they call it, that could help. She was on lunch. When she got back from lunch, she didn't speak English. And I try, I really tried my best. But at a certain point, you're dealing with technical terminology where I don't have it in French. She had very little English. She had less English than I had French. And the greatest part where if I were to script it in a movie, you wouldn't believe it happened, was when a Vietnamese guy was the savior for whom English and French were his second and third languages in some order. And he comes out and greets us with hola in Spanish. So we just what we needed, another language into the mix here. But eventually I got the parking permit. So all was good in paradise or Montreal. Anyway, that does it for us today. My thanks to all of you for tuning into the show and supporting the program. We'll be back next week with more of Canada's most irreverent talk show, the Andrew Lawton Show on True North. Thank you, God bless, and good day, Canada. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.